Hi there, and welcome to this video on A-level biology for the AQA specification, focusing on the topic of genetic information, variation and relationships, and in particular, on DNA, genes and chromosomes. I'm Manisha from StudyMind, where we help you to revise A-level biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject, your specification, and to you. If you're new here, please make sure to click that subscribe button. And whilst you're watching, feel free to leave any comments down below of anything you're unsure about, and let us know if it's your first time watching so we can send you our free revision resources. We also have helpful timestamps to guide you through the specification. So, let's get started. Welcome to lesson one of eight in this tutorial, covering DNA, genes and chromosomes. This is the first video in our series of eight lessons on the topic of DNA and genes. In the last lesson, we looked at digestion and absorption. Here are the key learning objectives for today's lesson. The first is to look at DNA and genes, then at chromosomes and alleles. We will then cover the anatomy of a gene and finally look at the functions of RNA. Here are the AQA specification points for today's lesson. Feel free to pause the video now and have a read through them before we begin. First, we will look at what a gene is. A chromosome consists of lots of DNA molecules. A DNA molecule is made up of lots of genes. And a gene has lots of base pairs. Some parts of DNA code for proteins, whilst others don't. Coding sequences are the regions of DNA which code for a particular protein or functional RNAs, such as ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA. Non-coding sequences are regions of the DNA which do not code for anything. These regions are usually regulatory regions of DNA, protective regions of DNA, or simply junk DNA. A gene is a specific sequence of DNA bases which codes for a particular protein or functional RNA. Genes are made up of coding DNA sequences. The bases are either adenine, thymine, guanine or cytosine. The order of these bases is unique to each gene. Each of the genes will code for a unique protein or functional RNA. Now let's look at triplets. If a gene codes for a certain protein, it needs to be able to make all the amino acids which make up that protein. Therefore, each section of the gene is called a codon and codes for a different amino acid. To understand how the base sequence of a gene links to the amino acid sequence of a protein, we need to understand the genetic code. This says that every three bases on a gene is known as a codon. And each codon encodes a specific amino acid. This means that a single gene is essentially a sequence of codons and that they are non-overlapping. Each of the 20 amino acids that our bodies use to make the proteins can be specified by more than one codon. For example, the amino acid glycine can be made of either four codons. This means that they are degenerate. These codons are referred to as the genetic code and there is a total of 64 of them in most organisms. Three of the 64 codons are called stop codons. This will signal the end of a polypeptide chain. 
One codon is called the start codon and it has the sequence ATG. This signals the start of a polypeptide chain. The remaining 60 codons will encode for the 20 amino acids. These amino acids in our cells are able to use to make proteins. Finally, the genetic code is universal, which means it is the same in all living organisms. We've just learned that each sequence of three bases represents one codon, which codes for one amino acid. This diagram is of an RNA genome, but the same can apply to DNA. This slide covers a different topic of protein synthesis, but it can be useful to visualise how genes are used to make amino acids and subsequently polypeptides. We can see the DNA polypeptides making a template strand, going on to make mRNA and finally a protein. Now let's look at histones and chromosomes. DNA is very long and needs to be packaged in order to fit inside the nucleus. First, the DNA must wrap around the histone proteins. This will form nucleosomes. Next, the chain of the nucleosomes is called chromatin. This can be used to make proteins. The chromatin is wound up to form a single chromosome. A single chromosome is the length of the total double-stranded DNA that was used to make it. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, giving a total of 46 chromosomes in the nucleus of every cell, only with two exceptions, which we'll look at later. Now let's look at prokaryotic cells. Let's fill in this table to look at the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Despite sharing a common genetic code, they are both very different. First, we'll look at the histones. In a prokaryote, there are no histones, which means no chromatin. This means that there is looped DNA and a supercoiled nucleus. Whereas in eukaryotes, the DNA in the histones will form nucleosomes. These will join to form chromatin. Now let's look at the chromosomes. These are present in both prokaryotes and in eukaryotes. However, in prokaryotes, they are short and circular. But in eukaryotes, there is one long DNA molecule. Finally, we will look at plasmids. Prokaryotes have circular plasmids whilst eukaryotes do not have any. Let's th run through those differences again with this diagram. First, we can see the chromosome in a prokaryotic cell. There is also an attachment site. Both the prokaryotes and eukaryotes have DNA and the eukaryotic cell also has chromosomes. The nucleus of the eukaryotic cell will contain chromatin, and the DNA is associated with histones. There are 23 chromosomes. Let's look at chromosome 1, for example. We have paternal chromosome 1, shown here, which comes from the father and the maternal chromosome 1, which comes from the mother. This is a homologous pair of chromosomes. 
humans have 23 pairs, which means that we have a total of 46 chromosomes. Here, we are talking about a single human, and we aren't focusing on reproduction. This diagram just shows that each homologous pair is made up of one chromosome from the mum and one from the dad. For example, in all the homologous pairs in you, you have one chromosome from your mother and one chromosome from your father, which is the same for everybody. Each chromosome has lots of genes. The genes are the same on every chromosome. They are the same on the maternal and paternal sites, but they might be different versions of the same gene, which are known as alleles. In the body, lots of cells divide by mitosis. During replication, each of these chromosomes will divide into two. This forms two copies of the paternal chromosome 1 and two copies of maternal chromosome 1. After replication, there is division. The sister chromatids split apart during this division. This shows how the alleles are passed down. Hypothetically, let's say that the gene for fur colour is found on chromosome 1 in mice. The child will inherit both genes from the parents. Here, the paternal gene is dominant and the maternal gene is recessive, but we'll discuss this in more detail later on. Let's look at this example. Whatever colour the fur the child has, dark or light, it will always have both genes. Here, we talked about alleles for fur colour. These are versions of a gene. The sequence for the gene for fur colour is the same in mice with dark skin and mice in light skin. However, there are minor variations in the sequence which result in different phenotypes of the gene. For example, eyes and hair may be coded by certain alleles. These will have slightly different base sequences, but will code for versions of the same protein as we can see here. For the height gene locus, there are two of the same alleles on both chromosomes. For the p-gene locus, there are different alleles on both chromosomes, but both of these alleles still belong to the same gene. Now let's look at mitochondria and chloroplasts. The nucleus isn't the only organelle which contains DNA. Mitochondria and chloroplasts will also carry it. This DNA is not associated with histones and instead it is short and circular. Now let's look at eukaryotes. It's important that you clearly understand the structure of a gene. Every gene has the following structural features. The first is a start codon found at the 5' prime end of the gene, which marks its beginning. It has the sequence ATG. Exons are the coding regions of the genes, which will contain the codons in order to make proteins. And each of the codons will specify a particular amino acid. The sequence of the codons and the exons will determine the amino acid sequence within the protein. Introns are the non-coding regions. These do not contribute to the final protein. The stop codon is found at the very 3' end of the gene. This marks the end of the coding sequence and it has three different sequences, as shown here. There are three major non-coding regulators of gene expression in eukaryotic cells. The first is the promoter region, where the transcription factors will bind onto. Next, this will activate gene expression. 
enhancers on non-coding DNA gene regions. These will allow transcription factors to bind to them and enhance gene expression. Now we will look at the genomes. The genome is all the genes found within a cell, whilst a proteome is all the proteins the cell can make. Since the genes of the cell determine the proteins it can make, the genome and the proteome will be closely linked. Finally, we will look at mRNA and tRNA. The information to code amino acids and make proteins is in the DNA. However, protein synthesis occurs in the ribosomes. The DNA is too big to move out of the nucleus. So how does this information get to the ribosomes? Well, the DNA makes a copy of itself called messenger RNA. This can leave the nucleus and travel to the ribosome, where amino acids are made for protein synthesis. Although there are many different types of RNAs with many different functions, mRNA is produced in the nucleus during transcription. Despite only accounting for 10% of the total RNA content of a cell, mRNA is one of the most important. It is made up of a single strand and is formed from nucleotides with bases U, A, C and G. mRNA can be transcribed from RNA polymerase too. tRNA is a type of RNA that carries and transfers amino acids. It will bring the amino acids to ribosomes. rRNA will form functional ribosomes, which can carry out protein synthesis. There are many different types of RNA, but you should definitely learn the three we've mentioned. We've now covered all the learning objectives for today's lesson. Feel free to skip back through the video and re-watch anything you feel unsure about. We've now completed. If you enjoyed this tutorial, make sure to subscribe by clicking down below and leaving a comment of the topic that you'd like to see a video on. Click here to watch the rest of our videos in our A-level biology series, or visit our website, studymind.co.uk for past paper compilations by topic and specification.